But um, as you think of your questions and you'd like to ask them, you can start making your way to the microphone. I'll start with the first question. And that is a softball question you might ask because this is one of the things that all these guys I think could, could spend an hour talking about. But why even bother with apologetics? Shouldn't we just preach the gospel? Why, why not just preach the gospel? Why do you need to bother with evidence? Why do you need to bother with debates? Um, why not just let the word speak for itself and preach the gospel? Mark, do you want to start? Sure. Uh, it's so we can reach more people like Lee Strobel who needed evidence, I'll let him speak for himself. But, but yeah, it, it, we're not saying you always have to use apologetics at all. I mean, there's some people, it's like they're ready. They, they, they've heard the gospel, they're convicted of their sins, they're ready to turn and trust in Christ. Then don't slow down and say, but do you agree with this? And what do you think? Of it? And then you're just slowing down the process. But as I said this morning, when ne necessary, when they're over here, and the God, you know, the commitment to Christ and following Him and uh, receiving His forgiveness is over there. Sometimes there's these barriers in between, and I have seen over and over uh, where you know, like that guy we did a Q and A once. Remember, he stood up. He was in the front row. It was the last question of a Q and A we were doing, and he asked a question. Lee answered it, and we heard him say as he was sitting down, he said, "That was the last thing holding me back from trusting in Christ." And it, we, we talked to him later. He received Christ that night. His life changed. But it's, you know, we all have friends who are probably two or three good answers away from really considering the gospel. That's why we do it, because people need that kind of information. Yeah, and I'd say, you know, we're told to do it, first of all, First Peter 3.15. Uh, but also there's a couple different functions for apologetics. So one is to reach people like me who are skeptics. The other is to deepen the faith of believers. And um, there was a guy I was interacting with online, and he said his six-year-old granddaughter, who's a kindergartner in a public school, was taunted by the other children on the playground because she believes in God. Oh, you believe in fairy tales. You still believe in fairy tales. a six-year-old being challenged in her faith at, at, at a public school. Our kids and our grandkids are going to be challenged in ways that older Christians have never been challenged. And they need to be ready um, that their own face is, faith doesn't get damaged and, and weakened by attacks. But that they, so apologetics has a twofold effect. You know, one is to build the faith of believers, the other is to reach out to non believers. And uh, so I think both are valid. Amen. And we, leave, we, we live in an increasingly, increasingly skeptical culture. And the internet has fueled that. And um, uh, so I, I think the need for apologetics is uh, exponentially going up. You want to comment on that? Uh, yeah, just to echo what they said, and on top of that, um, it's what Jesus did. It's what Paul did when Jesus had a friend who was doubting. The most loving thing you can do is be like Jesus and present the evidence they're asking for. As far as strengthening the faith, um, the story I told you about that professor, um, th there's more to the story, but suffice to say, uh, when I got hired at Texas Baptist, I met his brother-in-law on accident. Uh, he says, how'd you get into apologetics? I told him that story. And, and he said, that's my brother-in-law. And I was like, wow. He said, can we sit down and talk? As we were talking, he said, he's been a professor for 20, maybe 30 years. He said, I've had nieces and nephews take his classes. Out of those 20 plus years, your story is the only story I've heard of that someone came out with greater faith. Everyone else who's taken his class either just stayed quiet and passed through it or came out and lost their faith. And with tears in his eyes, he said, would you mind calling my wife tonight and sharing this story with her? We've been praying for him. It is by the grace of God I am where I'm at today. Because I'll tell you this, and I say it with a little bit of, I'm not going to go there, pray for me. It wasn't, I couldn't go to the church because I'd learned that lesson. I had nowhere else to go. Honestly, by the grace of God, I am where I'm at today. And if I can prevent that from someone else and strengthen their faith, yeah. my goodness, let, let's be like Jesus. Amen. Well said. All right, our first question. Go ahead. All right. Hello, gentlemen. Uh, I'd like to ask about how can we better reach our uh, the non-saved Jews because, you know, they suffered a lot of hurt throughout 2,000 years of history. And how can we better, you know, use apologetics to give that good reason because a lot of them are sh uh, a lot shut off to it. Um, so how can we better do that through the uh, avenue of apologetics? The question's about Jewish people. Is that? Yeah, yeah, okay. through, reaching them through apologetics. Well, I, I, I have a real passion for that. And... Uh, 
I think part of it is there's kind of extra spe and specialized study you need to do to understand what the Jewish ob objections are. Um, and some of it is also to understand, you're Jewish, aren't you, Steve? Uh, no. No, I'm you're not, not. okay. I, I'm just getting to know David. He's a Twitter friend I met for the first time today after tweeting for a long time. <laughs> but, uh, but I think we sometimes make the assumption Jewish people, like they know and believe the Old Testament and kind of have that part down and, and now all we have to do is then fill in the rest. And the reality is, the average Jewish person is much more secular than that. May, have, you know, they have some a little exposure to it, but often don't know the scriptures at all. So I think part of it is not assuming too much, but then really specializing. I think in things like the Messianic prophecies and reading books like uh, by Dr. Michael Brown, for example, who is a Messianic Jewish man who he wrote. I think it's five volumes five or six volume series on answering Jewish objections to Jesus as the Messiah. And I think if you specialize in those things, it can be very helpful. And uh, also there's a book I like a lot by Stan Telchin called Betrayed, uh, a guy I actually got to know, who a Jewish man who uh, his daughter went away to college, became a Christian. That's why the book's called Betrayed. He took it as a betrayal to his Jewish family that she would join a cult and do these awful things. So he studied for months to try to get his daughter out of the cult of Christianity. You can guess what happened. The more he studied, he became convinced, became a believer. And many, many Jewish people have come to Christ through reading his story. It's a little like a case for Christ for a Jewish audience. It's, it's his testimony with the evidence wo woven in. And he what, became a pastor. Yeah, he was a pastor and uh, traveled around the world. He's passed away now since then, but it's, his book's still available, Betrayed, and it's a great book to give to Jewish people, as is the case for Christ, where you interview Louis Lapides. Yeah, a Jewish man who his story is in there as well, and that's a, a great resource. So, a few thoughts. All right, thank you. Question right over here. Does the, um, the Baptist affiliation have any plans of bringing this seminar or any other seminars to corpus specifically in the next couple of years or so or bringing this one back in 23 or 24? the guy sitting next to you can answer that question well <laughs> you know I, actually you know when we are invited here um, when a pastor reaches out to us on the evangelism team they want to do something then we're we're here to serve the local church and so the pastors are our bosses. You know, the pastors tell us what, what they need, and we say, how can we help you? And so when your pastor and your ministers reach out to us, then we're able to work with them to say, how can we best uh, reach your community? And obviously, being Texas is such a large state, we want to try to represent and be at different places throughout the state to, to, to get the best representation. And this has been a great, like I already mentioned, this has been a great place to host a conference like this. So I know Eric and I would love to, to come back in a, in a, a few years, and so you can expect that to happen. Sometimes it seems like, because we're so far south, people forget about Corpus, you know? So We haven't forgot about you. We love you. Y'all are awesome. Y'all are awesome. All right, right over here. Hi, this uh, question is for Lee especially. Um, in our Case for Faith class at, at the local church in Arizona, some of the participants believe in a higher power. They're, so they're not Christians, but they, they have had a transformational experience, and they, they believe in a higher power. And so while I realize that doesn't get you into heaven, are, are they a threat to – for me, it doesn't seem like they're a threat to uh, Christianity or, or part of a secular war against Christianity. They're just – they just – don't go as far as Christianity. Do you, do you see them as a threat, or, and would you approach them differently? Well, um, they're non-believers. I mean, um, you know, to believe in a higher power, what, what does that look like? What could that be? It's not a Christian expression of faith, and so I would try to expose them to the evidence for the resurrection, for example, and and um, uh, try to persuade them that uh, Jesus not only claimed to be the Son of God, but backed up that claim by returning from the dead. Um, and And so it goes from a general higher power to Jesus uh, being, and, and, you know, I, I kind of took a backward approach uh, when I did my investigation um, in the sense that a lot of people start with, is there a higher power? Is there a God? And they'll look at uh, philosophical arguments and, 
the Kalam cosmological argument and the ontological argument and the teleological, all these arguments. I didn't do that because the way, I mean, I looked at that stuff, but I always focused on the resurrection because I figured if the resurrection proves that Jesus is God, then I've solved the question, does God exist? And, and so I just, I, I just find that to be so persuasive. And, and uh, I think the evidence, I mean, we talk about that tomorrow if anybody's uh, here at the church services at this church tomorrow morning. I'm going to give the evidence that I found persuasive uh, and tell my story of going from atheism to faith, focusing on the evidence for the resurrection. So I try to, I try to uh, introduce them to that. I think it's, I would affirm that you're right, there is a higher power. Um, you know, it's a great step, but there's more to it. And, and um, you know, this is not some amorphous, uh, deistic, a higher power, but a personal God who wants a relationship with us. Um, we're separated from him because of our sin. We need to receive forgiveness through Christ and put it into a specific Christian message. You know, I would just I'm add move this. Yeah, I would just add that you know, I think they're over the hardest barrier, really. I yeah. mean, to, they're already to a supernatural being. And a lot of times the objections people raise have already been answered if they believe in a higher power, but they haven't connected the dots. I think of my friend John Swift, remember yeah. the story, uh, where he he was in one of the spiritual discovery groups that Lee talked about, uh, and his le team leader set up a meeting with me because he said, I, you know, I'm, I'm close, I believe in God, I just, I can't believe in the resurrection. And I said, but you, you believe in a God who in some way created the heavens and the earth? He said, yeah. And I said, how hard is it for a God who created the heavens and the earth out of nothing to raise a body from a grave? Isn't that kind of simple by comparison? And it was like a light bulb went on. He goes, you know, I've never thought of that. And I think sometimes just to help people to see if you already believe in a higher power, my goodness, you're, you're you know, well on the path why wouldn't you, ex you know, here's the other evidence for Jesus, like you said, and for the resurrection. Well, I, I kind of helped him connect those dots, gave him a little more to read on the resurrection of Christ, and he came to Christ within a month. Didn't he end up going to seminary? Uh, that's a different guy you're, you're thinking of. Yeah. We have, we, we, we've been doing this 35 years. We know each other's stories. I, I can actually give Lee's testimony if you want to hear it. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, verbatim, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right, right here. Uh, I guess I have two questions. One will be for Mr. Lee Strobel. Uh, Bart Ehrman holds to a position that we can't accept supernatural claims as history. Indeed, why should we take Christianity claims about Jesus rising from the dead um, and comparing to other other, relig other religions like is Islam and Muhammad? Yeah, I missed the first part. You missed the question. Um, it was from Ehrman? Is that yeah, what you're Bart saying? Ehrman. From Bart Ehrman? Yeah. And one of his debates, he says that we can't take the, the supernatural claims of Christianity that Jesus is rising from the dead as history. Like, because oh. Yeah, I, 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 I just don't agree with that. It, it's a very simple historical question. Number one, did Jesus exist? Number two, was Jesus dead? Number three, was he reliably encountered afterwards? Those are historical issues. So I don't see how we can't investigate. Um, you know, Now, I, I can't give you... Uh, historical um, um, evidence of someone who saw him rise from the dead. But if he existed, and the, the evidence is totally clear that he did, if he was truly dead, and even the Journal of the American Medical Association says clearly the weight of the historical and medical evidence indicates that he was dead even before the wound to his side was inflicted. We have five ancient sources outside the Bible confirming his death. So we've got, we, he, li he lived, he was dead, and then the question is, was he reliably encountered afterwards? And from that, I think you can infer um, reliably that he was resurrected. And we have nine ancient sources. Um, um, you know, most, most, of what, most of the facts from ancient history that we accept are based on one or two sources. But for the conviction of the disciples that they encountered the resurrected Jesus, we have no fewer than nine ancient sources inside and outside the New Testament confirming and corroborating their conviction that they did encounter the risen Jesus. So to me, that's historical evidence. Um, you know, and, and not only that, but we've got um, the 1 Corinthians 15 creed that has been dated back by scholars to within months of the death of Jesus. It, it, it's so, it's got, its historical credentials are so strong 
that even one of the few Jewish New Testament scholars, Pinchas Lapid, said it may be taken as a statement of eyewitnesses. Um, we've got uh, Peter in Acts uh, saying uh, this Jesus God raised from the dead, to which we're all witnesses. We have him, we have, pa we have Paul confirming that he interacted with the disciples and they're teaching the same thing, that Jesus was resurrected. Um, I mean, we've got nine, nine sources. So um, I think that's a simple historical proof. He lived, he died, he was reliably encountered afterwards. And, and it's perfectly reasonable to make the inference that it's a resurrection. Did you have a follow-up? And uh, can, can I touch oh, on that yeah, too? With, uh, so, uh, and I've heard Urban talk about the, him and Mike Lincona, one of the world's leading scholars, had a seven or nine hour debate on the resurrection like a few months ago. Um, but uh, I, I know the one, one route Ehrman kind of takes because everything, uh, I echo what Lee said, and I've heard Ehrman also say, well, um, like, you know, as Lee said, that uh, you can make the inference. And I think sometimes Ehrman will kind of harp on that and say, okay, well, then it's not historical. To an extent, I'm fine with that uh, uh, because, it, sure, it, I, everything's undergirded with philosophy. So there's going to be some philosophical assumptions or conclusions that you could, sure, Ehrman could say it's technically not history. But at the same time, Ehrman would also argue against miracles uh, by way of David Hume by saying, well, miracles are impossible by defining them as a break in the law of nature. Well, that's not the definition of a miracle. If a baseball falls from the sky and I catch it, I'm not breaking the law of gravity. I'm intervening in the law of gravity. So if you're going to say, he's historically speaking, dead men naturally stay dead, yes and amen. But it's not a contradiction to say dead men naturally stay dead and God supernaturally raised Jesus from the dead. There's no contradiction. It's not an argument against miracles. And if he wants to call it philosophy as opposed to history, I'm fine with that too. Like Lee said, it's an inference. So my follow-up question is oh, for Eric. It would be... I know we were talking with Jorge Wright about God being the standard of good. So this is this question is posed usually by famous atheist Alex O'Connor. So why couldn't God be evil? <clears throat> so uh, let me rephrase the question. Could there be an evil God? Um, if we're just talking in purely in terms of logically possible, sure. But here's the point I would make. If evil is a deviation of good and you need a moral standard for there to be a deviation from, then by default... Evil, if I can use the big word, is ontologically dependent on the good. So if you have an evil God, I would say it, we could argue that therefore there must be a good God for this evil God to be deviating from as the objective moral standard. So even if I grant there's an evil God, well, you still have, you'd still need the God of the Bible to be an objectively good God for the grinding of goodness itself. Thus you have Satan. Sure, yeah, you can go there. Yeah, and go. I would just add to that, we have a track record of our experience as humans with God recorded in scripture of how he is good, how he is patient, how he is gracious, how he's forgiving. Yes, he ultimately will judge the earth and we see glimpses of that along the way, but mostly what we see is a God that has incredible patience toward the human race and that's recorded in history. Thank you, sir. All right, right over here. Yeah, uh, hello um, for the panel. Uh, got interested in apologetics from a conference like this about four years ago. Uh, been immersing myself into it. Want to continue to, to work that into the, to the ministries that I'm in now. Uh, so I guess the question is, um, how do I uh, continue to work that in, maybe into how you guys found in maybe your specialized um, ways that you guys pointed into that? Uh, how do you kind of just keep going, get started, and broaden that out, I guess. I know it's kind of all over the place, but. Yeah, I mean, one opportunity, I, we mentioned our center at Colorado Christian University, and, and one of the things we've done is made it convenient for people who are employed or in ministry, who are very busy, their parents, they've got kids. We all have busy lives. Uh, and so we made it convenient for people to be able to study apologetics at their own pace. And so, for instance, our master's degree program uh, it's 100% online, 100% accredited, um, but each course is only five weeks long. And um, you could work a full-time job and also take these courses toward um, an accredited master's degree, uh, for instance, from our program. And you can do that in cultural apologetics, which is uh, uh, social issue th issues like uh, same-sex marriage, things like that. Uh, you can do it in practical apologetics. You can do it in world religions or innovative evangelism. So, um, and, and at, at either at the undergraduate level uh, or the master's degree level, or as I mentioned, just certificate level, just take courses for your own growth and say, gosh, I'd like to take a course on the resurrection. So I'll buy a PhD 
uh, who is uh, studying in this field extensively and um, uh, uh, take the certificate course at my own pace. That's not accredited, but um, um, it's something that you can, if you take six of these courses, you kind of get a stamp of approval uh, as a, uh, you've completed the certificate um, of uh, study. So that's one thing I'd recommend is our, our program at Colorado Christian. If you go to strobelcenter.com, has all the information. Or the table back here. Yeah, or the, Tom, one of our representatives at the table uh, in the back. Was part of your question, though, how to integrate apologetics into the ministry of the church? I wasn't sure if I fully understood your question. Yeah, I think, uh, so I teach Sunday school, um, and, and there's sometimes I, I weave that in. Um, but I think it's, uh, from there, how do I expand that? I guess is the, the real question. Like at the church? Or yeah, e either broad, broader at the church, maybe it's an online ministry. Oh, yeah. yeah. You know, uh, I'll mention one other thing um, that you could use certainly with students or in um, churches. Mark and I did a, a six-week video-driven uh, small group type study called Making Your Case for Christ. Mm. And it's both about uh, apologetics and evangelism. And uh, Mark and I teach it. It was filmed at the Lanier Theological Library in Houston. And um, uh, we've had really good feedback from that as a, uh, something you could use in a high school ministry or with adults in a small group or medium group setting. And I, I would just add, I think part of what I, I think I hear you saying is, you know, how do you get more people interested? How do you get more engagement? And I would just say that to all of us that it's not like we're, apologetics geeks that have a hobby that we're trying to get other people to join our hobby. <laughs> uh, I, I'm not that interested in that, you know, but we view this as information that is spiritual lifeblood for people. And so I think part of, if, if part of it is how do, how do I whet the appetite of people in the church who think this is irrelevant and just for geeky guys like Eric and stuff, <laughs> um, who, who is a oh, drummer is a, in a rock a band, so he's not he's actually a geek. a geek. But, but uh, you know, I think part of what we have to do is attach it to the reality of what's happening with young people, including some of them in your own church, that this is about your kids, this is about your grandkids, and this is spiritual life and death. I mean, we, we heard a story about a gal who went to, Secular college, it was a pastor's daughter. She le left the faith during her orientation class at a secular university. Well, that's another example of where we have not armed young people with information that is spiritual life and death for them, not to mention how are we ever going to reach their friends if we're not equipping them to know how to answer. That's why I don't know where that group is, but we have that Ratio Christi group here from where are the ones with the crazy T-shirts? Where are you guys? Huh? Oh, they're they're probably out at the booth. I don't see them. But anyway, I mean, there there's a group of young people. I think they came down from Austin or somewhere. But I mean, they're learning apologetics at a young age, and not only is their faith going to be stronger, but they're the ones who are going to be able to answer their friends. And you know, we got to quit losing our world and start reaching it again. We're not just trying to defend our faith. Like we're, you know, rocked back on our heels and we're all defensive. We're on a mission to move forward and to be a, be confident and be, you know, out to win other people. Well, that's not going to happen unless we help inculcate this value in the church and help everyone to see this is relevant to your neighbors, to your kids, to your grandkids, to people you work with, to people in the neighborhood, to Uncle Bob at Thanksgiving. You know, all these people need this information. And so this is not some sideshow. This is central to the strength and survival of the church. Yeah, and, and I'd say yell at them. Um, I, <laughs> so that truth teller, that, that really, the more I think about it, the more I'm like that. I, it, especially given my background where I came from, and you know, you, I've shared some of that with you today. But um, So when people ask me what is apologetics, the best way I've found to explain that is I say, let me ask two questions and allow me to respond as a skeptic. Why are you a Christian? Why should someone else be a Christian? Within a two-minute dialogue, they know what apologetics is. 
one guy said, well, um, as an example, one guy said, well, because, you know, God, you know, sent his son to save my life. I said, well, I don't believe in God. Remember, I'm playing a skeptic. Okay. Well, it's because God saved me from sin. I'm like, again, don't believe in God. But what do you mean by sin? I'm curious. And he says, oh, well, sin is what separates you from God and this and this. I'm like, yeah, I still don't believe in him. Okay, well, sin is what, what happens when you do wrong and you bring harm into your life. I said, wait a minute. That sounds like karma. I thought you said you were a Christian. And he goes, can we start over? I said, sure. So we start over, and he says, let me tell you why it gets emotional. And he says, my grandmother was dying of cancer. We prayed every day with the church, and one day she got healed. How do you explain that there's no God? And again, I'm playing the skeptic. I said, interesting. That's the same reason I'm an atheist. Because guess what? My grandmother had cancer too. We prayed every day, and she died. So either God loves your grandmother more than mine, or maybe he just doesn't exist and things happen. I said, that's apologetics. Um, it was sobering for him. Uh, now, whether you would literally yell or not, it, it's up to you. But I find some people like what Mark was saying, this isn't, we're not, it's not a hobby. I mean, this is, one, the Bible commands it. Jesus did it. We're, we're called to do this. We're called to tear down strongholds. So at the end of the day, I tell people, I'm just trying to do what the Bible's saying. You know, uh, I, I had one person, he said, he made up his own little evangelistic track. And uh, it, it's, a, it's a much longer story, but I remember... I was one of the speakers at this conference. It was a general evangelistic conference. I was the first speaker. And then when he went up to speak, he started talking about the way he does it. And he says, at one point, he said, so you can do what I'm telling you to do. And he points to this handout he had. Or you can do what Eric's telling you to do. But the Holy Spirit gave me this. And I'm like, do I get a rebuttal or something, you know? Well, here's the irony, though. I pointed to a text that was given to us by the Holy Spirit. He was pointing to a text that he had printed off at Office Depot. By doing what I'm saying, I, you know, there's, this isn't Eric's approach. This is what the Bible is telling us to do. So I think when we can get people to realize, like Mark's saying, this is vital. This is necessary. This is commanded. And if you're going to be a Christian and do what Jesus wants you to do, then, yeah, we should do this. If not, well, sure, you can call yourself a Christian, but at least recognize you're being unbiblical. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Well said. Right over here. Hi. Um. Y'all talked about children and high school students. I have a 37-year-old high-function autistic young man, very smart, taking a, a computer course, IT support with Google. What programs do you have anything, if anything, um, for special ed young adults? Or how do I incorporate what I learned to help him? I, I'd say it's going to depend on, is he high functioning? Is that what yes. you said? Yes. Uh, so so while I, I'm not too terribly familiar with autism, I, I personally have a mental disorder, ADHD. I, like it wasn't a joke when I said it earlier. I really do. And No, he's got that you, in ADHD also. Yeah, so you, you can tell my medicine's wearing off because I'm talking faster. So <laughs> I have to remind myself. Um, what's interesting with some of these disorders, some of the most brilliant people, and I'm not necessarily putting myself in this category, have some type of mental disorder. There seems to be some kind of a tick, right? So what's funny is my wife can tell me to take out the trash. And in 10 seconds, and I'm not exaggerating, I wish I were, I'm sitting on the couch and she says, the trash is still there. I'm like, oh, that's right, you said to do that. And she says, how can you memorize these philosophical arguments but not to take out the trash in 10 seconds? <laughs> well. I think that's just men in general. Uh, yeah, that yeah. could be, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that could be. Well, uh, Amy said our brains don't form until later. I, I right, heard yeah. that Amy says. <laughs> So she almost, said 26. I think it's more like 56. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm almost 50, and it hadn't happened for me yet. So, <laughs> so, uh, so I say that to say, however, I could, and it's hard. It really, I really am challenged when it comes to reading. I prefer audiobook, uh, and even then, sometimes I have to cut my grass because if I can make my body busy, I can let my mind be free to concentrate. Um, however, with ADHD, there is some counterintuitive notion of what's called hyperfocus where if I can tune into something, it will be hard to get me off track. So what's interesting is you'll have some parents say, my kid doesn't have ADHD. He plays Xbox for 12 hours. And I'm thinking, 12? I did 16 the other day. Um, <laughs> it's just this, you, you just get locked in. And for whatever reason, and maybe because of the inquisitive mind that I have, I could look and, you know, attend 12-hour day or if I'm on a road trip or something, I'm listening to a podcast and just soaking this stuff up. I would see, find what interests him, what topics, he, you know, kind of give him a general overview. I know that this is more of a broad answer, but for me, it was a soul. For me, it was consciousness, free will. And then whatever he finds interest in, get him, get him the material he wants on that and see where he goes with it. And, and I think God will really do something with that. I just need um, 
blank, uh, something to look at for myself, like a list of programs, topics that he that I can say, oh, I know he'd be good in that. Do we have anything like that? I could, I'm not sure what the question is. Uh, well, uh, like mean, a list of apologetics topics yes. or the different group? I know, I know um, Kurt Juros just mentioned Apologetics 315 is a, is a website that has oh. all the different resources on one page that, that has been compiled. I know yeah, that's a good okay. Lee Strobel okay. has a website. I know many of the guys, you oh. know, Jay okay. Warner Wallace has websites. I mean, that almost works. all of the leading apologists have websites with a list of materials that you can begin to research. But okay. if you I, talk to us afterwards, too, we can probably give you some websites. And I'll just as well. throw this in. One of the most brilliant apologists in the world today is Hugh Ross, uh, who's an astrophysicist and uh, has a whole ministry called uh, Reason to Believe. And um, and I've looked at his stuff and listened to him for years, but uh, I was in a small group of apologists with him about five years ago, and he shared his testimony, and in the course of his testimony, shared something that I don't think he had gone public with until about five years ago, and that is he is on the autis autistic scale himself. And it kind of explains his brilliance in some ways. I mean, because, um, you know, he, he, well, He's just a brilliant person. He, he inter introduced a talk once, and he, he's talked about how when he was a young man, I think he was like 11 or something like that, his mom brought home a textbook on, uh, I think it was on astrophysics, and he, he read it like over the next couple of days and then told her there were mathematical mistakes in it. <laughs> and I said, that's very similar to me when I was 11. I was learning how to read. So, you know, we're very similar. <laughs> But anyway, I just mentioned that to say that there are some folks even that have the same kinds of issues and have learned to focus it. I mean, it might be inspiring to him to say, here's a guy who's this brilliant defender of the faith who has similar kinds of learning things and has learned to apply himself and become a world-class expert on it and has debated some of the top atheists. Maybe this could be someone you could latch on to and learn from. I don't know. It might be helpful. He even led a uh, Nobel Prize winning physicist to faith. Is that right? Yeah. So, brilliant guy. Yeah. yeah. Ross. And I would just say, I want to I say this with that question. Um, something that I, I've, I've emphasized and something we talked about quite regularly. Uh, you know, it's not, it's not more spiritual to feel than it is to think. Um, some people are really good with emotional stories and emotional connection. Um, that's very important to the church, the, the music, the, the art. But thinking is also, so God's created us with minds to think, and we need intellectual people uh, engaging in our churches. And so when people are gifted in that way, um, they need to feel like they belong in the church and that they're not less spiritual because they're more thinkers than they are feelers. We have a body of Christ, and we all need all parts of the body to make it function well. And I think the church has been very good engaging the heart, but less so engaging the mind, which is one of the reasons I think we've lost uh, a lot of men even to the church because sometimes they don't feel like they connect because they're not engaging in the intellectual conversations and arguments, which men tend to be more engaged in. That's not always the case, obviously, but sometimes they don't feel like they can do that because it's not as spiritual, and that's just a, a misnomer, I think. And so he belongs in the church. The church needs that uh, very much so. All right, right over here. So this is a general question from like the beginning with the Jewish faith um, how can we help people who have an idea who Jesus is we've been talking about people who are skeptics people who had questions but what about people who like members of the LDS or the Islamic faith who know who Jesus is but added to the faith and to their own merit their own foundations how do can we show them who Jesus truly is versus what the Islamic or LDS says? Well, I'll just share on the, I've shared with both, but let me just say something about on the Islamic front. You know, I often talk to Muslims who, you know, and they'll say, well, okay, we believe in Jesus. I've actually heard one say, we believe in him more than you do. Um, but we know who he is. He's a prophet. And so they have a, you know, 2 Corinthians 11 warns about people who teach a different Jesus, a different spirit, and a different gospel. It's not really the same. But what I say to a Muslim is, okay, that he is a prophet, but 
if you really believe he's a prophet, you have to listen to what he prophesied. Otherwise, you're not really respecting him as a prophet. Have you read what he said by the people who wrote down the stories, the, the Holy Angel, as they call it in Islam, which is the Gospels? Have you read the Gospels for yourself so that you really know what the prophet Jesus said, even about himself and his own identity and so forth? Most Muslims haven't. And in fact, a lot of them feel like it's a betrayal against their Islamic faith to pick up a Bible. Well, the Quran tells us the Bible is the inspired word of God. It's, the word, it's, it's one of the revelations of Allah. And it tells us he's a prophet. So why would you not want to read Allah's revelation about Jesus and Jesus the prophet's writings, or not writings, but words about his own identity and his own mission? And, well, the problem, of course, they get into is once you, they do that, they very quickly realize that Jesus did claim to be the Son of God, which Islam denies, and that Jesus did uh, come to give his life as a payment for our sins, a ransom for many, as he put it, and that contradicts what they teach. So they get into a real problem as soon as they do it, or in our, from our perspective, they can start getting into truth and start moving toward the real Jesus and away from the Islamic imitation. But that's what I do. I just say, look, you, you, you say good things about Jesus, you call him a prophet, read what he prophesied, and if you don't, you're not really honoring him as a prophet. Um, when, so yeah, next week I'll be going to Utah. There's a ministry called Maven with Brett Kunkel. He takes students out to witness to Mormons. So I'm familiar with the theology, so I'll be going to spend a whole week uh, in, in a week from now in Utah with about 100 students and some field guides with Maven. Um, yeah, suffice it to say they don't believe the same Jesus we do, but I, I'm really fond of C.S. Lewis's trilemma, liar, lord, lunatic. Um, and basically it's the idea is, given Jesus' claims and teachings, let me rewind, here's a dilemma. Today, Jesus is so influential, everyone wants a piece of him. Like, everyone wants a piece of the pie. Buddhists say, well, he was a Buddhist, because look, he followed Buddhist teachings. Muslims say, well, he was a prophet. Mormons say, oh, no, he was you know, one of our guys. Even, even the non-believer says, no, Jesus was pro this and that political position, which coincidentally happens to be mine, too. But, hey, Jesus was, was pro this or that. Everyone wants a piece of Jesus. Now, well, that, that tells us two things. People still respect him. That's good. But it also says another thing. People don't understand who he was, and that's not good. Because... Put it this way, liar, lord, lunatic. Basically, C.S. Lewis says, given his claims, he was either a liar, he was either a lunatic, he was a lord. I, I went to speak at this camp once, and um, uh, after speaking, it was late. I had like five hours to drive home, and the staff said, hey, we have a student here who volunteered his summertime at this camp. You could do that. Said he's recently come out as a non-believer, left Christianity, but he's looking into Buddhism. And I said, well, what is he doing here? And they said, well... They, he still thinks Jesus was a good moral teacher. So I'm like, okay, well, hey, too bad he wasn't here. Wish I could have seen him. As I'm about to walk off, the dude, like, walks right in front into our vicinity. I'm like, okay, I guess we're doing this, you know. So he confirmed what he said, and I said, so, you know, why, why here? He's like, well, I still think Jesus exemplified and told us to be good people, and I want to serve at a place where he's respected. And I said, you really think so? He's a good moral teacher. I said, he sounds kind of crazy to me. He said, what do you mean? I said, well, he told people to eat his flesh and drink his blood. I said, what sane person would do that? He says, yeah, but don't Christians have a way of explaining that? I said, oh, absolutely. He's a propitiation for our sins. He's a sacrifice, the atonement, but that only makes sense if he's the son of God. He says, well, I don't believe he's the son of God. I said, okay, well, then he's crazy. Well, I wouldn't say that because he says, okay, well, well maybe, he, maybe, maybe he's not crazy. Maybe, maybe he at least, um, uh, let, let's say he just he was saying that, but he wasn't. Okay, he's a liar. Well, I don't think he was a liar. Okay, we're, we're back to him being crazy, which is it? <laughs> and he says, well, I don't think he was a liar. Or crazy. Because I said, if your brother said he was the Lord, would you believe him? He said, no, I know my brother. I said, right. And Jesus had brothers who knew him. So let's recap. He's, a, he's either you're lying, he's either crazy, or he's a Lord. He says, well, I don't think he was lying. I don't think it was crazy. I said, well, me neither. So it looks like your only option is to fall on your knees and call him Lord. So he, he, it, it does seem like it's reduced to, the, to those three. But since... I've been around, like, the LDS, the Mormons, more often, and we've had, like, intellectual discussions between each other, and they've always had the debate that the Book of Mormon defends the Bible as, like, the second nail, as they would put it, but as trying to explain to them that the Bible warns about people who use him in his name and 
even don't even trust angels who come speaking from God. Um, how could we help them through that, though? That was part of the question I'm trying to find answers for as an apolog as an apologetic stance. Where I like to go with Mormons is more to the big issue, which I think is the big core idea that separates them from Christianity is that they believe in many gods. And for them, Jesus is a god. He was born as a normal human. He became a god. Joseph Smith is already a god. I've actually been in a Mormon church where they sing a song, Praise to the Man, where they praise Joseph Smith, their founder, who has now become a god. They believe they're mother, father gods who have baby gods. Who, I mean, that's that's Mormonism. And so I like to go to that issue and just say, um, you know, that's diametrically opposed to the Bible, which is monotheistic from beginning to end. There is one God. Uh, it says in Isaiah 43 that there's one God. There's only ever been one God. In fact, God himself says, is there any other God? I don't know of any. So the omniscient God says he doesn't know of any other gods and I actually had a chance I was in a meeting with one of the 12 apostles of the Mormon church and uh, it was kind of this cordial everyone was being nice and, and, and but they gave a chance for Q&A and so I just said I said I've got a really basic question maybe it's so basic I'm going to be embarrassed but I'm confused by something because I know you believe in many gods they often try to deny it but they you believe in many gods he didn't deny it and I said but you claim to only follow the one God of this world. That's the way they would put it, right? So I said, here's my question. Who is your God? Because you, I know you pray to the Heavenly Father, so he's your God, but yet you're the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, so you present Jesus as God. So that's at least two gods. Which is your God? Which is really the real God of this world? And, and if it's both of them, then at least admit you're polytheists. And he, he said, well, that's an interesting question. He thought about it for me. He goes, let me put it this way. I cannot imagine praying to the Father without thinking of the Son. And I can't imagine praying to the Son without thinking of the Father. And then he tried to, they tried to throw it back at me and say, isn't that what you do? I go, yeah, and I believe in the Trinity, the biblical doctrine that there's one God who eternally exists in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But you deny that. Well, then the moderator cut it off. He, he sensed we were getting too <laughs> hot. And so that was the end of the discussion. But the, the fact is, Mormonism, even though it's polytheistic and does believe in many gods, they claim that they're, in a certain sense, monotheistic because they only worship the God of this world. And even one of the 12 apostles couldn't tell me which of those gods was their real God. So my point is there, it's fraught with confusion and illogic thinking, and they don't know how to connect the dots. And I think if we can help them to see that and to say the only answer to this is a biblical doctrine of God, one God, eternal God, who doesn't change, who doesn't become, come from a man, you know, doesn't spawn new gods, uh, and who exists eternally in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's the only way to make sense of this. And I think that's, that's the way I talk to Mormons, to try to get them to see that big picture. And there are tons of resources. You probably are aware of some, you know, just Googling things. But I know we've had a, a Mormon apologist at uh, some of our events. Um, I cannot recall his name. I don't know if you can off the top uh, of your James head. Walker. He's a uh, former Mormon, became Christian apologist at our event last year. He did a discussion with the current Mormon apologist on what is the gospel. And Corey Miller, who's the head of Ratio Christi, is a former Mormon as well. And those are the best resources to go to, those who are experts in that field, and they have they usually have resources that go over every one of the typical arguments that you'll go through, and you can learn directly from those who've kind of been through that and, uh, and look at those resources. So thank you for your question. Right over thank here. Thank you. Hi. Uh, yeah, I have a few friends that uh, would identify as being homosexual, um, and I've shared the gospel with them. Uh, I've had intentional conversations with them, but I always – feel like I kind of hit a brick wall and there's only so far where their, their trust or their understanding of what I'm saying is going um, and it it's really burdensome like I, I think about it often and I just don't I, I I'm at a loss I, I a lot of times I, I'm I'm willing to be there for them and, and to care for them and listen to them but you know I share the gospel and it just just nothing happens and, and it's 
frustrating. So I don't know if you have any uh, insights or advice that you could share with us on that issue. You want me to share? Yeah. So, um, so l let me let me say something that took weight off my shoulders. Years ago, I realized I don't save anybody, so I don't have to worry about trying to save someone. Right? I worry about sharing the gospel and loving them. And once I've done that, my job's done, and I continue to love them. Um, so, so first, I, I, I want to say that I, I don't know, if, I don't know if that helped or not, but yeah, we, don't feel burdened because it's not your job to save them. You can't save them. I didn't save myself, much less can I save someone else. Uh, I, I remember there was some. Uh, I went to speak at this youth group, and these young men said, "Hey, we want to ask you a question privately, similar to what you were saying." But you know, it was there were teenagers said, "You know, so what should we do? How should we treat him?" And I said, "Well, let me answer it this way: Do you have any friends in your youth group that are having premarital sex?" And they said, "Yeah." I said, "Okay, don't tell me who it is, but how do you treat that person? Do you still hang out with them? Do you play Xbox with them?" Yeah. I said, "Okay, treat your gay friend the same way, right?" You share the gospel. They know your stance. Love them. After that, you pray for them and leave it to the Holy Spirit. You answer when it comes up. You stay quiet if it doesn't. Uh, if the Holy Spirit, you know, gets that unction, if you will, to something else. But once you've done what you said you've done at this point, it's in God's hands. And, and you pray and love and, and let the Holy Spirit lead you and pray that the Holy Spirit open the right doors to, to, to step in, close the wrong doors where you're not supposed to, and just be sensitive. Also, so don't, don't get discouraged because you never know where what's happening on the inside and what they're what they're going through, what they're thinking about. I heard sometimes the spiritual fruit doesn't grow on your own limb; it grows on someone else's. And and you plant the seed, and you might be you might be talking to somebody who's a negative eight or negative ten on the the timeline. And if they have to get to a plus ten to become a fully fo devoted follower of Christ, you might bring them from a negative ten to a negative, you know, three. And you don't even know it because they're not a believer still. But you, you've, you've shown them something. You've planted a seed. They're thinking through it. And you may be a first step on their journey to coming to Christ. And you may not know what happens in the future of their life. And so be faithful with the time that you've been given and what you've been told to do. But don't, don't allow that to discourage you from continuing to plant those seeds. That may or not, may not you may never see them, you know, uh, flourish. But don't get discouraged by that because God's always at work. I so. would also advise not to let the homosexuality issue become the single only right. issue in the thing. I love uh, the example, we we're friends with a guy named Greg Steer, who's the head of Dare to Share Ministries, and he had just spoken at a large Christian event, and on his way out, he was actually already in a taxi, and he saw some lesbians picketing. And he said to the taxi driver, lesbians, I want to talk to them. And he said, you know, people wondered how he knew they were lesbians. They had signs that said, we're lesbians. Um, <laughs> but I love what he did. He, he goes up to him. He goes, hey, I just spoke at the event that they were picketing. And, oh, well, you're like the enemy. Oh, no, no, no. We're, we got a lot more in common than you realize. And they said, what do you mean? He said, well, you lust after women. I lust after women. We're, we're all sinners who need a savior. <laughs> <laughs> and, and and he said he said the bottom line is we all need Jesus we all need forgiveness we and your sins might be a little different than mine but we are sinners and so he leveled the playing field and he did it winsomely he got him laughing with them and I, there's something real Jesus about that I think Jesus like and rather than like you know we have to resolve this issue we got to debate this endlessly. I don't think we're going to win that way. I think we got to get to the gospel uh, to say, even if you don't agree that that's sin, you got other sin in your life, right? You know, let's let's be honest here. I I struggle with areas you do. We need a savior. Amen. That's what, very well put. Right over here. I think this will be one of the last, maybe last one or two questions. Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, this is uh, addressed uh, primarily to Lee Strobel, but uh, this is also generally to everybody. Uh, I uh, am like you, Lee. I came to Christ later in life. Uh, it was due to the guidance of a winsome, loving Christian friend who I had. I was able to break down a lot of the objections I had towards Christianity. Uh, and then I was able to uh, counter apologetics, which is it was able to strengthen my faith. But my question is, in what way does apologetics uh, address, uh, let's say, breaking down objections rather than presenting uh, evidence for Christianity or breaking down objections against, like kind of uh, addressing, say, the emptiness of modern secular materialistic culture uh, and in a way that's winsome, that's not just sitting there uh, trying to be a, a cultural critic, but somebody who's lovingly trying to break down objections towards leading somebody to, to Christ. Yeah. Um, one of my mentors, who's sitting on my right, 
Uh, Mark Middleberg uh, always used to say, apologetics is like a battery. There's a positive pole and a negative pole. The positive pole is the affirmative evidence and philosophical arguments for the existence of God and the truth of Christianity. So things like, um, you know, the, the cosmological arguments, the teleological arguments, all the positive stuff that points toward the truth of Christianity as well as the resurrection of Jesus and so forth. And then there's a negative pole that deals with objections, and like how can a loving God allow pain and suffering? How can a loving God send people to hell? Um, and, and things like that. And so uh, apologetics accomplishes both. Um, I mean, it, it, it can, it can um, provide affirmative evidence that points in the direction of the truth of the faith, but it can also respond to what I call these spiritual sticking points that hold people up in their journey toward God. Thank you very much. Yeah, and that's really your first two apologetics books. I mean, the Case for Christ was a positive case for the evidence, whereas Case for Faith is addressing eight of the top objections. Yeah, I did a national survey. Actually, I, I don't know how many have read that book, but I, I started out with an interview with Chuck Templeton, who was the pulpit partner of Billy Graham, who lost his faith and became a famous atheist in Canada. And I interviewed him uh, for that book, Case for Faith, about his objections to God, um, and he actually broke down and, w and wept during the interview because he missed Jesus. And, um, and then in the book, I respond to those objections that he raised, as well as a national survey I did to ask people what their objections were to Christianity. Um, and then the book ends with me sending the manuscript off to him to read, because that was the end. Um, I just recently updated the book. It just came out. Uh, there's new material in it and a new epilogue where you find out that Chuck Templeton ended up coming to faith on his deathbed. And, um, yeah, um, as best we can determine, he did come to faith at the end. So that was something you didn't know when you wrote the original Oh, no, book. no. It happened after the book actually came out, and um, he died. And he's in his uh, hospital room on his deathbed, and his wife, Madeline, who was a deist, so she... Uh, not, not a Buenos Dias, but what's a, a Dias? <laughs> yeah, what's a Dias? Um, she's not predisposed to color it toward Christianity, but uh, so she tells the story of how um, he's in this hospital room and he says, "Madeline, do you see them?" So what are you talking about? They're here. They've come for me. What are you talking about? The angels. They're in the room. They're coming to take me to heaven. I believe I'm going to spend eternity with God. I'm, I mean, he apparently came to faith at the end of his life. So that's encouraging for people, I think, who read the book, and it kind of ends a little bit inconclusive. Uh, the new edition does get into what actually took place uh, later. All right, our last question right here. Um, my wife will test this. Uh, so for, for me, I struggle with uh, there's a timeline. You know, there's a schedule. We've got to stick to it, right? So how do you uh, how do all deal with I have to be somewhere at a certain time, and somebody comes to talk to you, and uh, you're, you have somewhere to be, you got something to do, just uh, maybe you can uh, share with us some encouragement with that. You know, it, it strikes me, I, I've written about this, that most, or at least a lot, of the famous stories of encounters Jesus had with people who he healed or spoke to or answered or led to faith were on his way to do something else. And, you know, he was on his way there, but then along the way, there's this guy, a, there's a leper, there's a, a blind guy, there's someone calling out. And so he stops and does that. So for me, those are good reminders to say a lot of, a lot of stuff happens on our way to do what we were going to do. And God likes the, to put these divine interruptions in the way. And so to stay open and to be prayerful and say, God, help me not to miss opportunities that you want me to have. At the same time, we live in a real world where you have to be certain places, and there are times where you have to, you know, there are also places where there were a lot more people that wanted to be healed, and, and Jesus said, we're getting on the boat, we're going. So I think it's kind of a Holy Spirit question of saying, I want to be a responsible person that makes it to work on time and, you know, doesn't blow things off and does what I need to do, but yet be ready for those unexpected adventures, right, along the way that God can open the door to and ask him to lead. Amen. Very well said. Very well said. Y'all give them one more round of applause. Thank them for coming.